different type of content today than the normal geology undergraduate level lectures that I tend to provide. Instead, what I'd like to share with you is a lesson that I've developed for my graduate level courses and my undergrad courses that help teach the students to become a better writer for the term projects in my class, but then also for their theses and their publications as they grow in their career. This lesson is aimed at the general science writer, not geology specific, although my examples tend to be more geology themed. Some people who are listening to this are beautifully um, gifted at writing. It's an innate skill they have. Maybe they were just born with it. They get it intuitively. And other people who are going to be watching this have always struggled with writing. You've had teachers tell you, you're not very good, you're not elegant. And so what I would like to do is just explain or explore some quantitative ways some are qualitative as well, to try to improve your writing. It's, there's going to be seven tips in this lesson, and they're all taken from like outside sources. And I've just condensed to the, to the seven that I think are the best. And I guess this question about why should we bother is somewhat obvious, right? And there's different arguments you could make to advance in your career. If you advance in your career, you make more money, you get more publications. Um, but maybe it's just to sound as smart as you really are, or even smarter. And some of this research is based on this paper here by Daniel Oppenheimer, who, um, and there's a lot of other science that has gone on to how should we write and how should we write better, right? And in this paper, he says, consequences of erudite vernacular utilized irrespective of necessity, right? To drive home the point, and almost a joke in his title, right? That write simply, don't add things that are overly complex if you can avoid it. Right? Even though, and, and like here's some facts, most people admit to it to try to give that impression of intelligence. And in fact, the strategy is wrong. What should you do instead is write simply. Look at this. 110 Stanford undergrads were pulled. And what did they do? They made their writing more complex in order to appear smarter. Sometimes we do that. And that is the wrong strategy. Instead, what this study found, and I mean, if you want to scan it, you can. What this study found is that if you write simply, you score a higher mark in terms of like perceived intelligence, the ability of your audience to understand you, realistically, that should be your goal, than if you add unneeded complexity to your words. All right, so let's get back to the actual content that I'd like to share with you. And so for the next, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 minutes, I'm gonna go through these seven points. And maybe if you're taking notes, you could follow along with it. You don't have to pause the video right now and write this down because we're going to hit each one of these in a decent amount of detail. Some of them are really obvious and some are more complicated. The first thing I recommend you do is try to keep your sentences shorter. Write 20 words or less because if you start droning on and on, the attention span of your audience is going to lag and your sentences are going to be come too complex. So here's an example that I wrote in a publication that came out in 2020. This is published and I'm a pretty good writer, right? I'm a professor. And I wrote this sentence that was 34 words long. Although the hydrogen isotope composition of volcanic products provides a metric that can track and identify magmatic source, fractionation, or degassing processes, hydrogen isotope measurements have never previously been acquired for undegassed silicic melt. It's published. But it could have been better if I had taken more time while I was crafting my writing. I could have maybe broken the sentence up into two. You see that by breaking the sentence at degassing processes, adding a transition phrase, my writing in terms of at the sentence level becomes simpler. This is a good tool to try to do. Now the next thing to do would be to try to shorten things at the word level. There are certain words that we use all the time in science. Look at this one, utilize. Oh, I hate it when I see someone use utilize. They're mostly just trying to sound smart because it's simpler just to say the word use. In order to means the exact same thing as to. However, has seven letters, but means almost the same thing. It has only three letters. These are ways to cut out extra letters, cut out extra words, and yet maintain the meaning. Now, the tips I'm giving you are not hard and fast. They're not laws of nature. These are preferences. These are guidances. You're going to have other faculty that love the word, however, instead of but, and they're going to have great reasons for it. So, or even maybe let's say the word utilize. Can you use the word use seven times in a row in a paragraph? No, you shouldn't. Like if you're writing your methods, maybe you do sprinkle and utilize twice. These are guidelines. I think you're getting it. All right, let's keep going. Let's look at some examples. You should endeavor to write a smorgasbord of communication in a clear and simple fashion that lends itself to exceptional content. That's what I want all my students to do. But can we shorten this? 
and achieve the exact same message in an easier way? Of course we can. You should write in a you should write clear and simple content. That's the message. Why did I bury it with all these other words? Well, I'm giving a teaching example, obviously. But we do it accidentally or even purposely to try to sound smart. And I think it, it, it undermines you as a writer. Here's another example. I'm inclined to acquiesce to your request. You've probably heard that phrase before. What is the person saying? Simple. Yes. Keep your writing simple and clear. Now here's one of the trickier ones, those, those first two are easy. This third one is about active voice and passive voice. Writing has changed in the last two decades. When I was being trained in scientific writing, um, we were trained to write with passive voice, passive voice, passive voice, to not appear selfish, like me, 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 I, 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 we, 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 we did these things, look at us, we're important. Instead, use passive voice to let the emphasis be on the task or the science or the data, not the actor. That has changed in the last couple decades, where now people write in active voice as much as possible because it's a clearer, um, it's more legible, it's more easily understood by your audience. So here's a couple examples, and it, this is again one of those places where it's not hard and fast, you have to do it. Maybe write 80% active voice, 20% passive voice. If you say we, we, we in three sentences, maybe in the next one, maybe the next sentence, flip it to passive voice. It's okay to have this flexibility as you're writing. Um, here's a kind of a fun, cute way to go through. Can you tell if your sentence is in passive voice? If you can add by aliens at the end, you're definitely in passive voice. The the boys did the dishes is passive. No, no, no. What is that one? The boys did the dishes. That's active voice. The dishes were done last night. Passive voice. Because you could say the dishes were done by aliens. Or in this example, which you've probably heard many a time, you will, you will be rocked by aliens. How have you actually heard this in a very catchy, awesome song? We will, we will rock you. A great example of a message being changed by going from passive voice to active voice. Would Queen's song had been just as awesome? It had still been just as catchy musically, but it wouldn't have been quite as catchy lyrically. So here's a couple more examples of taking passive voice and making the sentence more readable by putting it into active voice. Inclusions were analyzed by aliens, passive voice. Instead, just rewrite it. We analyzed the water contents. There are many reasons that bubbles form in volcanoes. I published a sentence that said that. Why did I do that? I should have just wrote it bubbles form. Look how it's even fewer words. All right, you see the last example as well. Now this is another, this has to do with the structure of your sentence. Follow the funnel. That's just a uh, easier way to remember the idea. But the main concept here is this upside down triangle. When you write a paragraph, when you write a paper, start general. Let that first sentence or first paragraph be understood by everyone. And then as you build through your paragraph, build towards something more specific. Let me show you some examples. In fact, this is a game I play with myself and I play with my, my uh, scientific colleagues. We try to write the most simple sentence we possibly can when we start the introduction of one of our writing exercises. I've never published one this simple, Volcanoes Erupt. I'm sure I would get congr congratulatory emails from a couple of my colleagues if I was able to pull that off. But you get the idea, Volcanoes Erupt. You know what that means. A three-year-old knows what that means. That's a good place to start because it's so general. The second sentence might be, eruptions are driven by gas. It's more specific. What type of gas? Let's get more specific again. This gas is carbon dioxide. Let's tell me more about carbon dioxide. CO2 bubbles form deeper in volcanoes. We've gone from the broad to the specific within a single paragraph. You can do this at the sentence level. Well, maybe not the sentence level, but the paragraph level. And certainly the um, entire paper should follow this type of structure. Now here's... Um, a final, here's a good example of a finished paragraph that goes from general at the start to more specific. Magma always contains water. The water, which is dissolved at the molecular level, the amount of dissolved water controls how magma erupts or crystallizes in the subsurface. So to better understand, notice that clause, we, sorry, it's clause slash transition, we studied water and magma. Specifically now, we looked at small glass blebs, frozen magma, trapped in a protective jacket of quartz crystals. 
Look how we got to that end. That's the technical bit I want to convey to my scientific colleagues, but this is where I start. Now, at this point, you might pause the lecture, and or if you're teaching this topic, this is where I give a homework assignment to my students, where I make them build a paragraph short, like this, with kind of bullet points, to demonstrate they have four to five simple ideas that go from general to specific, and then I ask them to write it into an actual uh, paragraph. Maybe I have them rewrite part of their thesis, or I have them do this this semester, I'm having them write the first paragraph of their introduction of their term paper, like this. And so here's one way that this might look. Let's see if we can do this. So from that previous paragraph, I would say, uh, sentence one, magma has water. Water is dissolved. Dissolved water uh, controls stuff. Let's say, let's say just dis dissolve water controls. Now, in the sentence, I say it controls a couple things like explosion, explosions, and also crystals. All right, very simple, but you see how I'm building to more specific things. So then I go active voice, we study water, technically in volcanoes, but I don't need to say this in my little uh, summary. And then we, uh, how do we study? We studied we studied uh, special crystals. That would be the first thing I ask my students to do for their own specific project. And then my hope would be they'd be able to come and write a paragraph, something like this. And this is a really nice way to get over writer's block because, and it's sort of like outlining, but if you build with pieces and make sure you're logically building the structure, then the actual words you choose later can, uh, yeah, they, they kind of evolve. Yeah, that was an awkward bit, but let's transition now into the next thing. And I did this pattern in the previous writing, and maybe you saw it. It's called no new. That's the way I'd like to call it, at least here as I'm teaching you. Basically, we have we established some known commodity, some known fact in a paper, and then uh, or in a sentence, and then we build to a new concept. So every sentence is starting with something that's already known, maybe from earlier, and then at the end of the sentence. We put new content. So all the sentences in a paper are connected to one another. If we look back at the, the bullet points I just pulled out, what do we have? So magma has water, water is dissolved. Here is what is known, because we've known it from earlier, and then we introduce something new, it's dissolved. So here it is, so here's dissolved, this is known, we've established it in the previous sentence, and now we're building something new. It controls something. Maybe I didn't uh, there's no really great connection here, but maybe it's water to water and then study to study. Okay, that's what I mean by no new. Let me show you a couple more examples of this. So here's one. Volcanoes erupt. Eruptions are driven by. Here is what is known. Gas is new. Often this gas, gas is known because it connects back to the previous sentence. But here's something new. What type of gas? CO2. Start the next sentence with CO2. You could make a prediction what next sentence needs to happen. So if we have CO2 bubbles form deeper in a volcano, maybe the next sentence has to build on something that's in this sentence. Maybe it's the word bubbles, or maybe it has to do with the word depth. I don't know. But if you can see that that is a building structure, then you're getting the concept of known to new. It's one of the harder ideas for my students, but it is one of the things that makes your writing flow the best. Here's an example, maybe a little more complicated. Minerals can also entrap small parcels of magma as crystals grow. After entrapment, the crystal host provides a protective jacket. This protection preserves the magma as small glass inclusions. So here we're using, well, it's almost the same word, but it's not the exact same word. Using very similar words, almost synonyms like protective to protection, clearly is a known new, but it's not the exact same word. So then you don't feel like you're being super redundant. That is a great synonym, right? What do we do? Uh, thesaurus.com or is it synonym.com? I use it all the time to look up words to help me make connections but not sound like I'm repeating myself again and again and again. Another thing I go to the internet for would be I'd Google, I Google transition words because one of the best ways to make your sentences flow well together is to use transition words and not repeat the same monotonous one again and again. I'll be honest, I use the word thus far more than I should. My PhD advisor used it way more than he should too. Uh, that's probably why I started using it so much. But there's ample uh, transition words we can use. Here's an example from earlier in this lesson where I showed a sentence that was way too long, right? And I need to break it in two sentences to connect 
those two sentences together, I threw in this transition. It's a phrase, it's not even a single word, but it's a nice, it helps the legibility and ties these two ideas together. Um, there's many of these transitional words out there. Dynamic geologic processes are thus not recorded by hydrogen isotope. Oops, I should have this highlighted in yellow, right? It's a transition word that connects this first sentence to something not here. There had to have been something before it, right, for me to use the word thus. You can tell I copied this out of one of my previous publications. But there's a, there's a transition word. Instead, the rhyolitic melt represents isotope reservoir. Instead's a great one to use. And there are, what, a hundred different transition words that you can find, and you can have your favorite ones that make you, that you think are the most smooth or elegant and just pepper them through. A great way to go through uh, transitions is to set up lists, but not bulleted lists. Rarely can we use those in publications these days. But if you have you set up three processes that could have caused this, first, second, third, or first, second, last, or first, next, then, finally, Right? You get the idea. There's a lot of different transitions, and they help tie sentences together and maintain homogeneity within the message you're trying to deliver. Now, here's one of the big ideas here at the end, and maybe something you've never seen before. And what's really special about it is it's a way to quantify your writing. Right? Writing is often treated as a touchy-feely kind of subject. There is no absolute right or absolute wrong, and I agree with that. But for those of us who are more engineering-minded, more scientifically, more math-minded, it would be nice to have a formula that can be applied that could guide us to better writing. And this flesh reading ease score that Microsoft Word provides is a really nice way to quantitatively assess your writing. And the way to turn it on is to go into your properties. It's never turned on automatically. It has to do with the grammar and spell check in Microsoft Word. And in a Mac and in a PC, there's two different ways uh, to find it. But if you can find this panel, you should pause the video right now and actually go find it yourself. Word, preferences, spelling, and grammar. Come down here to the bottom and assess and put that check mark in. And then run it after you've written a paragraph or a page and see what score you get. The goal for the score is the highest number possible. So here's a paragraph that I ended up writing. Not a very long one. It had 91 words. It had that many letters. It told this, the spelling and grammar check told me that I had four sentences, average 23 words per sentence. Not bad. Probably would have been better if I could have kept that under 20 words per sentence. The word length was around six words, six letters per word. But here's the number that I want you to focus on. It's your flesh reading ease. The score goes from zero to 100. The higher the number, the easier it is to read what you've written. I'm not saying you need to get 100 every time, but I am saying don't get a zero. The mathematics behind this score is actually pretty simple. It's a game you can play. Anytime you put a shorter word or have a shorter sentence, you get a higher score. And so here's how it looks like um, in practice. Dr. Seuss writes, hop on pop, the dog is red. That is like 100. Very easy sentences something for a first grader or a second grader to read. That is not what we're doing in academic scientific writing. So don't try for it. More popular writing at the fifth, maybe sixth, eighth grade level is gonna land in the 80s or so. And 80 is something that everyone can understand. You can imagine the amount of money that some company like Apple puts into writing their uh, press releases, or writing their marketing on their website. They actually aim for around an 80 so that everyone who can spend money on their products has a chance to understand what they're trying to sell. Some other uh, uh, scientific writing, Stephen Hawking's uh, book averages around a 60. Um, Roberta Rudnick is a writer that I think is very good in geology, and um, I'll show you an example where she scores a 40. But the typical academic journal, the typical legalese terms and conditions, these range in the zero to 20. And a lot of them are landing closer to zero. And I want you to try to aim for a 20. I think that's a really good number to aim for as you write many paragraphs written with a very technical and high level. So here's an example uh, in a scientific article written by Roberta Rudnick, an expert in igneous petrology and how the, like, our plate tectonics and continents work. The Earth has an unusual is an unusual planet in our solar system, and having a bimodal topography that reflects the two distinct types of crust found on our planet. 
That's a long sentence with actually some fairly long words. Maybe she's going to get a low score. The low-lying oceanic crust is thin, composed of relatively dense rock types, such as basalt and is young. In contrast, the high-standing continental crust is thick. It's composed of highly diverse lithologies that yield an average intermediate or antacidic bulk composition and contains oldest rocks and minerals yet observed on Earth. Look at that third sentence. That is very long. It's very specific. It's using technical jargon, which we have to use as scientific writers. You can't not use it. And yet she still scores a 39.4, something I've never achieved in any of my publications. This is what we're going after. Let me show you some more examples. So here's a snippet from Stephen Hawking. For millions of years, mankind lived just like the animals, and something happened which unleashed the power of our imagination. We learned to talk and we learned to listen. Speech has allowed the communication of ideas, enabling human beings to work together to build the impossible. That's beautiful writing. 57.2. You might have get that once or twice in your publications. It might be too simple in general. Here's another simple example of scientific writing, right? For the, this is not a, this is for a book, right? From the book Pale Blue Dot. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. How did Carl Sagan get such a fantastic score? Look at the length of his sentences. That's home. That's four letters. That's us. That whole sentence is just seven letters. Okay, you can't do this in everything, but you're getting an idea about how you can manipulate your writing score and in cases improve the readability. Now here's an example, right, that we've looked at a number of times. This is the one that we split into two sentences from before they got published in 2020. Why didn't I edit it more? I don't know why, but here I edited that sentence to try to improve my reading e-score. I needed to improve it because this sentence is a zero. Oops. Well, with a little bit of editing and not sacrificing any of the meaning, I got to a much more readable sentence. To identify the source of magma, fractionation, or degassing, we can measure its hydrogen isotopes. Despite this promise, no one has yet measured hydrogen isotopes for undegassed silicic melt. It's still specific but it's clearer. Here's, oh, I, shoot, I didn't put the reference for this one. This is a paper about um, COVID and vaccines that I was using as an in-class demonstration. Uh, it's a really well-written paper, and that's the reason why I use it. And even though we're geologists, my students, undergrad and grad, were able, they all agreed, we can understand the paragraph. This is the intro paragraph of this author. Vaccines prevent many millions of illnesses. Well, you can read this if you'd like to, but the idea is it scored a 12.6, and yet all my students have been able to understand it. With some editing, no offense to those authors, they did a great job, but they could have even improved their score. Here with some editing that I did, um, I got it up to a 37. And if you flip back and forth, if you wanted to take that time, you're doing an exercise for your class, you're serious about learning the writing, flip back and forth, and see, here I'll flip for you. You can pause it, flip back. The message is the same, but the score improves. Here's another example from me, from my 2020 paper. I scored a 5.1 on this sentence, this series of sentences. And as you read this, there's gonna be a couple things maybe now that are catching your eye as gonna be reasons why my flesh reading score is bad. Here's one, laboratories. In fact, I think I highlight the problems. Maybe your eye caught these ideas. Were selected, puts it as passive voice. Big word, laboratory, acknowledge, manuscript, measurements. Simple word, but a lot of letters. Well, with some editing, after I acknowledged these different places that could have problems, I was able to create something that's quantitatively 10 times easier to read and increase my score to 52.4, right? Cause for celebration. To calibrate our hydrogen isotope measurements, we chose one synthetic and six natural rhyolitic glasses. And the rest of this paper, right, instead of the word publication, I think, we call these glasses our standards. Note, I use that word now instead of acknowledge, right, a lot of different letters, that these have not been analyzed by independent labs, so we cannot prove they're spatially homogenous. That's better writing. So these are the seven we went through. I hope they landed with you. 
Best of luck in your writing. I hope it goes well. See you next time.